All right, if you have a Bible available, I encourage you to go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. That will be the start of our study here this morning. Um, while you're turning there, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to, to do it this week, uh, to have this opportunity not only to do the study, but have sermons for you all week. And I hope the things that I say to you, and I'll probably say this again when we start our, our morning worship, um, I hope the things that I say to you are encouraging and edifying to you. I want you to think, I want you to kind of open up your hearts and your minds and your Bibles and and be a audience that will not only take these things and, and hide them in your heart, but also tell them to the world too. So um, if somebody would uh, read there in First Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. Thank you. What I want to talk about here this morning is what is said there in First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always have the answer of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear. Have you ever been in a situation when you have, um, when the opportunity of religion or things concerning your faith have arise, and you have not had an answer for it? I have. Uh, and, and one of the things that was brought up in this this particular discussion was a guy was checking out at a family dollar or a dollar general. It was a dollar store, and he was on his way to check out. And, and while he was checking out, uh, faith came up on one way or the other, and, and he was asked if he believed in Christmas. And while he was having this, this question asked to him, uh, at this particular time, another person behind him asked another question as well. And you think of the most inconvenience of inconvenient times, the question arose at this particular situation where it's at a dollar store and he does not really have an answer prepared. He may know, he may know the, uh, what needs to be said if it was maybe at a, a formal setting. He may know how to discuss these things in a church or in a place of worship. But when it comes to a very uh, oddball place such as that, maybe the discussion is not ready to have that kind of answer. And sometimes even our answer could be the wrong way of approaching it. I think sometimes when the scribes and Pharisees talk about certain things, they weren't necessarily wrong in their answer, but sometimes the way they put the application in was wrong. And what I want us to do today is, as we're going to look here throughout this week, I want us to think about there may be possibilities or maybe thoughts that we should have when it comes to some of the things that we have probably read over and over and over and over again. Let me ask you this. Raise your hand if you've been a member of the church for longer than a year. Okay. Okay. Raise your hand if you've been a member of the church for longer than five years. 10, 15, 20, 30, 35, 40. Do I need to keep going? 60, 50. Okay. 
Still have a 60 over here. Okay. But but think about this. We have been members of a congregation for quite some time. When I look across the audience, there's a lot of individuals that's been here five to 10 years, if not longer. But think about how often has religion been brought up when it's not someone of the church, when it's not a member of the church. How many of you ever had a discussion with a family member that is not a member of the church? Raise your hand. Okay. How many, raise your hand, have ever had a, a discussion about religion when it came to work? Okay. How many have had a, a, a question about religion in a restaurant? How many has ever had a question about religion when it came to a ball game? I can raise my hand on that one. I'll tell you that story here in just a second. How many has ever had a discussion about religion playing a game? I want you to think about that. I'm not saying, I'm not doing these things to embarrass you or insult you or anything. What I want you to do is really think about when the opportunity does arise. Are we ready to pounce on it? Are we ready to talk about it? Can we talk about it in a way that, that, that is in a manner that does not kind of offend or push off? I had a young lady that uh, told me she was a lifeguard uh, at a pool, and a guy came up to her and asked her, he says, uh, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And she said, yes, I do. And he kept on wanting to talk about it and talk about it and talk about it where it became a distraction because she was there doing a job. And she, she left looking at that kind of situation as being bothered more than anything. And sometimes when we approach certain individuals, we do just that. We don't come to them as individuals that try to encourage and let them search the matter out. We come to them and we bother them. And sometimes we got to wait for our moment. And sometimes, and I've said this many times, we only get one shot. And that one shot counts. And that's why Peter, I believe, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, tells us when that moment arises, we got to have that answer. And keep in mind that we can't be individuals that have all kinds of information within us, but the application of the answer sometimes is not what it needs to be. So what I want us to think about, though, is when it comes to an individual that we need to discuss things, I want you to emulate one particular individual. And that's Columbo. Does anybody remember the show Columbo? He's not, you know, he's not good looking like Tom Selleck and Magnum P.I. And he's not, you know, he's not smart as Benedict Cumberbatch and Sherlock. But he brings a kind of an attitude when it comes to talking to someone, and he always had that little phrase he says right there, just one more thing, and he asks a question, a question that has an obvious answer. And what he does is he approaches this, not making statements, but making questions. And you do find in the scriptures a lot of times when confronted with religious error and religious situations, you see that it's been addressed not with a statement, but with a question. One individual that, if you ever had an opportunity to read the book Tactics, he talks about how one time he went to a restaurant and this lady was a Wiccan. Does everybody know what a Wiccan is? And she practices and she believes, you know, everything on earth is the God and, and she believes in nature and how life is is well preserved and stuff. And, and he knows this pendant that she wears that identifies her as Wiccan. So he addresses this pendant. And she says, Yes, I am Wiccan. She could, well, he, he also continues, said, Well, you must also believe, must be pro life. And she said, No, I'm not. He's confused by it. And the reason being is because if Wiccan is all about life and, and things concerning life, then they're not pro choice. And it comes her off guard and she thought about being wicked and when we have these kind of situations maybe instead of making a statement maybe we need to start with a question you think about an individual who does not believe in baptism that's always been kind of the 
uh, kind of situation when it comes to our faith today that there's many out there in this world today that believes that baptism is not part of salvation. Usually we start with a statement. Well, we go to we go to Mark 16, 16. He who believes in the baptized shall be saved, but he who believes not shall be condemned. We go to Mark or Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. But we never go and say, why? Why do you not believe that baptism is a part of salvation? Let me give you an example in Scripture. The Apostle Paul tells us there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. Somebody would read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. All right, thank you, Chuck. What what is being asked there? When you look at that, look at verse fourteen. Just we'll just look at verse fourteen by itself. What is being asked there? Okay, we see where it's about what does one have to do with the other. Why would we want to be with other individuals that do not believe in the same things that we do? That's the question that's being asked here. And Paul is not telling them a direct statement, well, not right away, but he is reminding them, ask yourself this, what does Christ, or what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? Then he goes on and goes, what fellowship has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What's the answer? Nothing. And that's the answer that they should come to the conclusion with. When Paul makes this statement here, he is telling them, what does a believer have with an unbeliever? Nothing. And he's not telling them this to kind of embarrass them, but he's asking them, ask yourself this question. And this is why you see Paul brings these questions throughout many of his epistles. He's not trying to get them to feel shameful about themselves necessarily. He's trying to get them to understand why would you do something like this if you know that's wrong. That's a big thing with the church of Corinth. They were doing a bunch of things wrong, and Paul was trying to tell them, why are you doing this? So he is trying to make this statement, and he's trying to get them to understand where he's coming from. And remember, he's asking them, and there should be a kind of a response back to us. We know it's a letter, and there's not some, some automatic thing that we could find that continues on with this particular epistle. But it does make a statement here. So when it comes to an individual, when he does not believe in the baptism is a part of salvation, that's the first thing I wanted to ask is why? Why do you not believe in this? Uh, we have been taking a, a study on Wednesday nights at a congregation I'm working with down in Ohio, and we talk about, we're talking about church history. And it's super fascinating. And it's just because you can understand why we see such a divided group today. And it really starts with, with trying to spread this message and who has the authority to spread this message. And unfortunately, as the years go by, the individuals that had the authority to spread the message, they're not really spreading the message anymore. They're really kind of sowing discord. That's why you see the Roman Catholic Church where they're at now. And this is why you see thousands upon thousands of denominations today. And it's because we tried to make the argument one has the authority over the other. 
And we don't really make Christ the authority of any of it. <laughs> but when you find out in church history, there's where you get an opportunity that you can have a discussion. Because if you deal with Catholicism, one of the things they'll keep arguing is they got history on their side. Well, if you take a study on that history, you'll find out it doesn't. <laughs> Actually, it makes an argument that we shouldn't be following Catholicism if you study it. When it comes to like all the denominations today, like the Church of Latter-day Saints, or you look at uh, you look at Methodism, or you look at Baptist or Baptists, and you look at some of these um, the Mennonites, for example, some very interesting things. It started because they was against Catholicism. It doesn't mean that everything they do was right, but they do recognize that things were wrong. And this is why you see the the Reformation, and you see. Uh, you see the post-Reformation, then you see uh, um, kind of this the splitting of congregations. So, um, does anybody have any thoughts or any comments before we continue on? You know, when I was young, when I was young in the faith, uh, one of the big things was debates, and uh, some of the debates I thought at the particular time was I thought was pretty neat, um, and it probably was a good learning tool for someone young in the faith. But for me to mature as a Christian, probably wasn't a very good idea. And I went to see other debates, like one in Alameda, California, and. And I did actually see a debate between Catholicism and, and Church of Christ, and both of them was not very well handled. Um, it ended up being more divisive than anything. It just seemed like all we want to do is pick a fight, and um, the other group kind of looked like it wasn't prepared to talk about these things. Um, so you see nothing really pro profitable from it. But you can't, not saying that all the debates are bad, I mean, we kind of, uh, if you look back in the mid 1800s and the er, to the early 1900s, debates were something that was profitable, and you could learn some things from some individuals, both sides. Uh, but now we're at this point now where we're so strong in opinions and positions that we're not willing to listen to the other side, whether they're right or wrong. We're not willing to listen to the other side, and sometimes we need to hear the wrong, and sometimes we need to ask ourselves, are we right? And while, while sometimes we come back and we say, well, I know where I stand because I've done this for so long, sometimes we need to kind of just take a step back and examine ourselves. And that's where the Apostle Paul tells us to do that. Because if we're not careful, we can be kind of in the same category as the Pharisees and the scribes. We wrote the, we wrote the word, we have interpreted the word, and we've done it so long, we know what's right, we know what's wrong. And look how they acted towards Jesus when Jesus tries to correct them. Most of the time, they wanted to kill him. So, uh, anybody else have anything to add? Very good. And that requires patience, too. And I, I, I've told this story before. I had a, uh, I have a friend who's gay. And it took two years 
to build that relationship. And it's because there's that stereotype in, in the mindset that anybody who's religious must hate gay people. And you've heard the horror stories of how some individuals that proclaim that they're religious, how they treat those individuals. So when, uh, and when I was, I, I worked with him at the time, when I, he came in and I came in and I was a preacher, now think about how he's going to talk to me. He's probably not going to talk to me at all. So I had to build a relationship with him. And I came to find out that he was living out of his car. And I went to Jason. I said, Jason, I said, why, what's going on? Why are you doing this? He says, well, I've gotten to a point I can't, I can't get the place to place anymore. So I helped him take care of that. And over a two years time, I finally have a moment to talk something spiritual to him about Christ. It took two years. Sometimes because we're in this kind of urgency of now, we think that we don't have that time. No, we got that time. We just got to make best use of our time. Remember, he tells us to redeem the time and make best use of it. And sometimes when it comes to making that use of that time, we, we kind of focus on the idolatry of, of urgency. And sometimes we think we got to be like Peter and say it now. Do it now. Act now. And sometimes when it comes to, to one another, like our brothers and sisters in Christ, there should be that act now. But when it comes to the world, we think we should do the same thing, and sometimes it doesn't need that. So, anybody else have anything to add? And sometimes uh, we can even see our own brother like that too. So, um, and th there's where kind of the immaturity comes in as as brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, and that's what's going to be nice about this this week too is, you know, we're going to look at passages. Like I said, we're going to look at passages that we have seen over and over and over again, and we never take a thought about what does why did Jesus do this? Why did Jesus wept? We always say to ourselves when it comes to Jesus weeping is because you know, because Lazarus died. Well, no, there might be more to it than that. So I think, there, and I do believe there's more to it than that. So what'd you have to add there, buddy? Yes, and, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about her this week, too. <laughs> and we'll talk about, you think about some of the unique situations that we find in the Gospels of Jesus having a discussion with individuals and how he responds to them. Sometimes we see it, and he's very pleasant. Sometimes we don't see that pleasantness. And usually it's the individuals that should know better. And But uh, one of the things that I find interesting with Christ and we don't really talk about it, is sometimes he got angry with people, particularly when he asked about the withered hand. He says, and 
Um, that's a part of the passage there in Matthew chapter 9. And he tells them, he says, is it better for you to, uh, uh, to be sick or, or, uh, or be forgiven of sin? And uh, they never responded. And he got frustrated with that. And there was anger there when these individuals should know better. So, uh, and that's what he's telling us here is ask a question about the things that the, of the hope that's within us. And I find it encouraging when it comes to when it comes to individuals out in this world today that don't know a lot don't know a lot when it comes to spiritual knowledge. You think about the accessibility of the Bible, and you think about the the attitude of individuals today that believe that there is a higher being. Statistics change all the time. They were from 75 to 90 percent of this nation believe that there's a God. And you think about the accessibility of a Bible, and it is not hard. You probably you got one probably in your pew. You probably got one on your phone. You probably got one on your tablet. You probably got one at home. You probably got one on your table open wide to a certain passage that you like. You think about these things and how much is it really being used? Are you using it on a daily basis? Do you meditate on these things? And there's, when it comes to these questions, it comes to this discussion, it's not, a, not only to try to understand man, but it's also for us, how do we respond to man when they give us an answer to their question? And you think about, when I was young in the faith, I had, a, uh, you know, I was a preacher that wanted to, had the burning of spreading the gospel, and anytime somebody brought up God, I wanted to talk about it. Now, I wanted to talk about baptism. I want to talk about instrumental music. And I want to talk about, um, at that time, I want to talk about modesty and, 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 and what we should wear to church. And, and I want to talk about all these subjects and never really wanted to start off with just, well, what do you find in God? What do you believe in him? And, and why do you not believe in worshiping him? Because if you look, churches are dying all, all across the nation, and COVID didn't help matters much. And we never, go with the, we never go with really important questions. We want to go with things that we have a strong belief and we're ready to talk about, because we could talk about baptism all the day long. We could talk about instrumental music all the day long. We could talk about the Lord's Supper all the day long. But we don't talk about some of the things why they don't go to a worship, or go to a place to worship God. And, and this is why Jesus will talk to common people and he will try to bring them closer to God, like the woman at the well. You think about how uh, she wanted to obtain this water she'd never thirst for it ever again. And the thing that she kind of went there for, she left without taking. She went there to get water. She left her container there for the water to go back in town and tell him about the Christ. Just how he talked to her. Even though he kind of calls her out on her adultery, he still wants her to receive this water, this water she'll never have to thirst for ever again. And we say to ourselves sometime, because of we know someone's life situation, we don't want to talk to them about it because they'll never change. You think about an individual who's been married multiple times and she's not supposed to be with the individual she's with now. How do you try to bring her to the gospel? How do you bring to an individual who struggles with addiction or alcoholism? That's a challenge because not only you're trying to help them overcome the addictions that they're dealing with, but you're also trying to bring them closer to God. And that's a challenge sometimes, especially with if you're trying to do this and you don't really know anything about addiction or the struggles with alcohol. That's a challenge because I've come to find out in my experiences that people are willing to come closer and have discussions if the individual's been down that road before. Because if you've never had to deal with addiction, if you've never had to deal with those kind of struggles, it's kind of hard to see where they're coming from. And that's just, the, that's the truth of the matter. Anybody else have anything to add?
I have a friend down home. His name is Brian. And Brian's been in prison. And Brian's got tattoos all the way up to his chin. He's got tattoos all over his body. And, I mean, you can spot him a mile away when he walks in the door. Uh, after services, I come up to him. And I said, Brian, I said, do you realize there's things that you can do that I can't? Because Brian hit rock bottom. Brian tell, told me the story about how he comes to this realization of God not when it was, you know, when his grandmother and his mother was still alive and trying to encourage him to stay in church. It came to him while he is in prison and he hit rock bottom and he turns to God. And from that point on, he builds up his faith. And I told Brian, I said, there is people that you can reach that I can't. And I said, that's what's beautiful about the individual. Because the end of it, we, we sell ourselves short so many times that we think that I'm too young or I'm too old. I'm a widower. I, I am a, a man, in, a middle-aged man. I am a divorced woman. I am a, we just excuse ourselves of all these incapabilities of what we can do. And uh, I tell about this one girl at my congregation named Caitlin. And don't be mad at Caitlin. She's going through some hard stuff because she's in Oklahoma sooner. And uh, <laughs> she's going through some bad stuff right now, so pray for her. But uh, she is big in Oklahoma. She's a, she's a sooner boomer. I think that's how you say it. And uh, she comes to our little congregation in Clarksburg. She's on scholarship to be a gymnast at Glenville. And the thing I find so encouraging about Kate, she's just this 18-year-old girl that comes to West Virginia and has to learn how to dress warm. <laughs> and she has brought her family to our congregation. She's brought her mom and dad. She's brought her brother. And, and she's brought family members to our little congregation. She's brought, she's brought her, her classmates, her roommates, and her teammates to our congregation. She's brought her boyfriend who is now baptized in the Christ. And he's at Glenville too. And I'm worried about him because she's trying to convert him into Oklahoma Sooners as well. But the thing I find interesting about Caitlin, she's only been there one year. And look all she's done. In the one year she's been at our little congregation. And then we say to ourselves, I, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> don't sell ourselves short. I have a lady there. She just had her 80th birthday named Donna. I love her to death. She sends cards to everybody. And she'll send cards just to send cards. It doesn't have to be your birthday. You could be just having a bad day, and she would send you a card. And that's what's beautiful about Donna. And she thinks sometimes that all she does is do this. And I said, you don't realize how many people appreciate that. We was going to have a party for her, but her uh, daughter came up and took her away from us. <laughs> but, you know, here she is, a widowed 80-year-old woman. And she's doing a lot. You know, it always, I, I, I was going to promise myself, I wasn't going to mention Joyce this week, but... But Joyce, <laughs> Joyce, when she was at Winding Road, I remember how many flowers she would fill out for a gospel meeting. I think it was like 3,000. And you wouldn't think there was not many people in Parkersburg. <laughs> but she did it every gospel meeting. And once again, we just say to ourselves, we just, let's quit excusing ourselves that we can't do something. Let's say to ourselves we can do something. And let's take these kind of attitudes that we see and the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ and even God, how we can build on trying to help individuals. And sometimes it needs to start with just asking questions. Am I done? Yeah. One more bell. How many? Five minutes? Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go to our next thing. And look how the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. And this is trying to encourage an in, these individuals and remember, Romans is about individuals that are going through some very difficult stuff, but yet are still doing things they shouldn't be doing. 
If somebody would, read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Thank you. Paul is trying to encourage a group of individuals here that they need to stop doing some of the things that they used to do. And sometimes when it comes to an individual out in the world that has lived in the world for a while, and now they have to kind of take on this transition, do not realize that there's going to be difficulties ahead. You think about the Apostle Paul, and that's, that's kind of the mind-blowing one here, is the Apostle Paul makes this kind of drastic change from being this Pharisee himself to being this follower of Christ and preaching Christ and him crucified. And he does this for two years. And, and during this time when the Apostle Paul is doing this, he is being persecuted by his old, his old peers. And now he wants to join the new group. <laughs> And the new group doesn't want him there. You think about lonely, how lonely that could be at this time where you're, you're kind of switching teams here. And you're doing it for the betterment of one's soul. But yet, you're not being well received, though. And I want you to remember that the next time someone's been baptized into Christ. Because when an individual has obeyed the gospel, that change is going to be drastic because now his friends are going to think differently of him or friends are going to think differently of her. And the weakest moment, it's going to be at that particular time. I was fortunate just about a week and a half ago to baptize a sister in Christ. And uh, one of the things that I found interesting uh, was what the, what the brethren did there at Pleasant Valley. Uh, one lady in particular came to her, and she gave her her home phone, her cell phone, and her email, I think. <laughs> she wanted to give all kinds of communication to this young girl if she needed anything. She needed a ride to services. She needed to talk to somebody. She needed, to, she needed something she's dealing with, and, and she needs to talk to someone. Whatever the case may be, she made sure she had the opportunity that she can call her. We did this after services, and sometimes we just want to get home. <laughs> preacher was way too long, and I was a preacher that night. <laughs> and, you know, I'm back there shaking hands, and this young girl says, you know, I'd like to be baptized tonight. Can you do it for me? I said, yes. And so let me finish shaking hands, and we'll go ahead and do it. And some people just want to go home. And, and I understand, trust me, from my perspective on Sunday, you know, at the end of the day, I'm probably the first one to bed. And individuals got to go to work the next day. So I do get that. But here's a group of individuals that kind of stuck around still. And they want to see her go through this step. I remember a young lady down at Wine Road when she was baptized in Christ. My kids, who are all teenagers now, they were very young at the time. And Peyton Carter wanted to run up and watch this young lady get baptized. And I said, well, let them, let them do it. It's, it's going to be cool to see them experience this. Uh, you know, there's, there's those times that we really need to help individuals out, not only when they make this transition, but imagine when someone sins and they have to repent. I do believe that there's individuals that have done sin and never in a public manner and never repent of it in a public manner. And it's because of the fear that some people are going to look down on them. And instead of having the opportunity to kind of look down on them, try to support them and build them up. And sometimes because of how we present ourselves, sometimes that's why repentance doesn't happen. And it's because we just feel like no one's going, to, people are going to think less of us if we have to do this. So, 
Anybody have anything to add before I finish? All right. Well, thank you for your time. I hope you've been encouraged by this. If you have any questions about anything I said, uh, by all means, don't be afraid to ask me after services. I'll be more than happy to talk about it. So thank you so much for your time.